By the time uh, I will fly to space in May, I will have trained four and a half years, uh, starting from the time that I was selected uh, up until my flight. And that includes basically one and a half years basic training, uh, general astronaut training, and then uh, yeah, two and a half to, to almost three years of specific mission training. Basic training was really a general astronaut training. It's kind of like the, the basic, uh, basic university uh, training that we get when you study at university, which is like a general questions about how spacecraft in general work. We also had to study Russian uh, in order to later get training in Russia. We did a lot of sports. Uh, we, we understood how our uh, like experiments will work on, on station. Uh, we uh, tried to get a common understanding of science because we came all from different directions, like we were pilots, engineers, scientists. So it's basically just uh, to get everybody to the same level. And, uh, and uh, after that, we, we advanced into mission training. The mission training is uh, more tailored towards the actual mission that we have on space station. So uh, basically we train the the systems that we have on the, the International Space Station, how to repair them, how to take care of them, how to work with uh, robotic arms that we have outside the space station, how to fly into space uh, on a Soyuz rocket and uh, on a Soyuz spaceship. Uh, so it's tailored very much to the actual mission that I have. The European Astronaut Center in Cologne is our main training facility. Uh, we're actually here right now, so if you look around me, you, you see different training modules of Columbus uh, Science Laboratory of, of the European Space Agency or the Automated Transfer Vehicle, which uh, is, plays a big role uh, for station logistics because it supplies uh, the International Space Station with uh, fuel and resupplies. So uh, this is our training hall in here. This is the core where I really spend many hours uh, training on systems and how to dock the, the ATV on the space station. To me, coming to EAC for training is really like coming home. Uh, it's because I've spent my basic training here, so I know the, the people well, the trainers, I know the mock-up well. It's kind of really like uh, training in my own backyard. One of the main tasks of my upcoming mission is uh, the docking of the ATV-5, hopefully, if the timing works out. So uh, I'm training this uh, here at uh, EAC. Uh, this is a big part of the training. Uh, of course, ATV is uh, basically the most advanced uh, vehicle in terms of navigation and control, and it does all its approach and the docking automatically. Nevertheless, uh, we as astronauts uh, are there to to double check, to, to make sure that the docking process works well and uh, in case of any problems, so far there weren't any, but in case of any problems, we have the possibility to interact and send the vehicle away. Uh, so that is uh, a training that we have to get here. It's, uh, it's a very, well, complex task because you have to watch a lot of parameters. You have to watch closely what the vehicle does so you can react quickly. As part of my mission training, I had several hundred hours uh, in the pool, in the spacesuit as EVA training. Uh, for one, in the, in the US uh, EMU spacesuit that we use on the American segment of space station, but also on the Russian Orlan suit, I was uh, very lucky to get that training as well. So right now I'm qualified for both spacesuits to do EVAs in space. Well, overall, the, the two different neutral buoyancy facilities are very similar from a perspective of a crew, of an astronaut who's inside a spacesuit working on the module. It really doesn't make much of a difference if, if you're in the, in the Russian pool or in the, in the US-American 
cool. Uh, the spacesuits are a little bit different, so the, the US suit was actually built for space shuttle. It was built to be serviced on ground uh, and very agile in space, so it's very movable, it's, it sits tighter. Um, and it, it allows like a wider range of, mo of motion, but it's harder to service while in space. The Russian spacesuit, however, was actually designed to be completely serviced by the astronauts in space. So after every EVA, uh, we just uh, replace the certain parts, recharge the oxygen, and then it's ready to go back out again. It's also um, designed for being entered quickly, so you can put it on quickly and get out the door quickly. Uh, but it's, it's not as agile as the American suit. Overall, both suits have their own uh, advantages, each, each for their own. So uh, there isn't really a good one or a bad one, or uh, they're just different. After all, it's a spacesuit. The US uh, spacesuit, the EMU suit, actually has a system called SAFER that allows uh, a return to a space station if I ever lost grip on station and uh, lost my safety rope, my safety wire, I would have uh, a little rescue system. And we actually train how to use that in the virtual reality lab. So I have a 3D glass uh, on, and 3D goggles on, and I have a little mock-up. And uh, it's actually hard to, you have to train it for a while to operate, to actually come back and not miss the station and fly into the blackness of space. Although you have to say it's a very unlikely scenario, it has never happened and also in order to have this happen several things would have to go wrong before. So you'd have to lose your safety wire, you have to lose your safety anchor and you have to lose your grip. So it didn't happen and also the Russian suit doesn't have that system and uh, it, it just uses uh, two carabiners that you uh, operate in parallel so you whenever you move one carabiner it's important that you still have the other one attached and also have one hand grip on station so you have at all times two attachment points so it really is uh, a safe system even without the safer and uh, so far it never had had to be used when flying to uh, international space station which with uh, three uh, big uh, science laboratories, uh, many, many scientific experiments. Uh, often in expeditions we have more than 100 experiments. It's really hard to pick out a main scientific activity because uh, it's so diverse. We have so many different, uh, different experiments on board. One of them that I, um, that I like though, um, it may, maybe because it, for me as a scientist it's good to uh, work on a, an experiment from, from beginning to end, is the electromagnetic levitator. It's an ESA experiment that we fly to space station. It will be on the uh, ATV-5 uh, when I'm uh, on space station, hopefully. And I will unpack it, I will install it, and I will check it out, do the testing with it, and maybe start some experiments. And, and this is uh, an experiment where we see how uh, liquid metals mix to new alloys and we, we produce new alloys that mix only in space. Uh, as you might know some materials just don't mix on earth like water and oil everybody knows that from home they just don't want to mix. In space it's no problem at all and the same is with with liquid alloys uh, in a way. So up there we have the chance of of investigating new materials, new alloys, to, to bring them back home and then see how, how good they are, how strong, how, how, what's their weight and can we use them. And if we find one, a good one that we can use, then we can go through the effort of actually producing that on Earth too. So it's a, it's a testing laboratory for new materials. So in, in 10 years down the road, your car might have a new lighter engine that, uh, that needs less fuel made out of space material. Yeah, one of the very interesting experiments for a geophysicist like me, of course, is uh, GeoFlow, which was on board space station in the recent years. Unfortunately, uh, it will be uh, finished by the time I get up there, so I'm not involved in the experiment uh, directly, but I follow it very closely because it's an experiment that shows us how important it is to go uh, to a, a place that might be very strange and in, unintuitive, like space, to learn something about our own home. With GeoFlow, we fly to space to investigate the interior of Earth, which is very interesting to me because you, you go out to space to look at something that's underneath our feet down here. But uh, it's the only uh, possibility to do this uh, properly uh, because of the lack of gravity up there. 
and by that we investigate how our magnetic field uh, on Earth is generated and of course how stable it is, uh, how long will it protect us uh, from cosmic radiation in the future and can we predict for example when it gets weaker. So uh, a very relevant scientific experiment uh, that I'm yeah, uh, following very closely. Centrifuge training was brutal in a single word. Uh, at the beginning they, they sit you in there, it's a, it's a 26 uh, meter centrifuge in, in Star City in Russia where all the cosmonauts have trained. Uh, you sit there uh, and you do a few rounds that are like at, at 3G or 4G, it's a, it's a nominal launch they call it, that's the, the loading that you would experience during a normal rocket launch and, and 3G means that you're pressed in your seat with the three times your body weight. Uh, but that's not the brutal part. So actually what comes later then is when you do uh, the off-nominal re-entries. That's basically saying that what, what happens if our spacecraft gets out of control, it has, a, it has an emergency mode where we can still land safely, but uh, we experience 8 to 9 Gs and we, we run that in the, in the centrifuge. So for, um, for a few moments I, I, I'll sit in there and basically my, I'm pressed in, into my seat with, uh, with eight or nine times my body weight, which means I'm unable to lift my hands because if my arm weighs, say, uh, 10 kilos, in that situation it would weigh 90 kilos, so you can't lift it. So, so all in all, for me, it was a great experience for a person uh, that likes to go on roller courses, but uh, also at the same time, it, it was brutal. I mean, it's something that you, you wouldn't want to do every day, that's for sure. I think all astronauts are very aware of the risks they take uh, when they fly to space. We analyze these risks uh, very closely. Uh, we watch what uh, systems we have to deal with, what could be the the emergency situations that we deal with and we train a lot. About 30% of our training is actually emergency training, uh, not only in the spacecraft on the way uh, up to station, but also on station and of course uh, while we are uh, doing an EVA in the spacesuit. Um, as we've seen with uh, the, 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 the situation where Luca had water in his helmet and that shows us how important our training is. He reacted well, he did exactly what he trained and uh, that, that shows me personally and how, how important it is to do that training well, to, to have the mindset of, hey, uh, if something happens, what would I do right now? To never lose that vigilance. Seeing Luca come uh, back down and come out of that Soyuz and looking so great gave me confidence in that uh, this is going to be a great experience. He wrote that to me before that he's looking forward to that ride, to that roller coaster ride uh, in the in the Soyuz uh, just the day before he left. And seeing how he got out of there, I'm very sure he got uh, the ride of his life out of that. So I'm looking very much forward to that, uh, just from a from a personal side as well. Just uh, after all. Uh, everybody in us has uh, that little child still there looking forward to, to flying on a rocket. Mm -hmm.